So Josh, I'm so happy to be talking with you. We've already had a long print conversation and, uh, and uh, podcast on this topic, but um, so you are a Greek scholar, classic scholar, and political scientist, right? Uh, I've learned so much from you about uh, this ancient Greece from a, uh, for me, an evolutionary uh, perspective. And this project centers about the concept of organism and society as an organism. And I wanted to ask you, I think, two questions. One is the degree to which the Greek city-states were kind of an organism, and also how that was understood by the people at that time. The whole metaphor of society as an organism, of course, was you know, present in people's minds, such as Aristotle and, and so on. So not only did the Greek city-states kind of qualify as an organism in ways that we'll get to, but also that that's how people were thinking of it. So could you comment on, on that? Yeah, I think the interesting thing about a Greek city-state is first that uh, these were indeed pretty tight collections of substantial numbers of individuals, anywhere from a few thousand to um, a few hundred thousand individuals in a given um, city-state in an ecology of city-states. So by the time we're at the age of Plato or Aristotle, there's something like a thousand of these uh, around the Mediterranean. And so uh, in some ways, like the ant colonies that Deborah Gordon studies, uh, what we have is these individual groups um, which are cohesive, they act um, uh, cohesively as, in some ways, quasi-organisms in an ecology of similar, um, as it were, quasi-organisms. Uh, with which they both compete um, and cooperate. We have, I think, the key way of thinking about what goes on within the city-state as well as between city-states is the management of cooperation in the face of conflict. Right, and so in strictly biological terms, what we have here is what would be called a metapopulation. We have a population of populations. You just said there were nearly a thousand mm -hmm. and that they're competing. They're in some sense replacing each other and they're certainly trading information um, uh, extensively and they have a subsistence ecology. So it was very easy for me with my ecological background to appreciate what you were writing as, you know, definitely a, a multi-level evolutionary process. Evolutionary change, including cultural change, could take place within any one of these polities and did, including of the disruptive variety. And I think that um, uh, we could focus on that, but also extensively taking place between these, these, these polities. So to what extent were, were the people at the time sort of self-aware of this and thinking of their polis as, uh, as, uh, as organisms? So Aristotle probably is our best evidence for this. Um, he's very self-conscious uh, about the relationship between human systems of organization and uh, other biological systems. So famously, uh, Aristotle says that humans are political animals, and he uses as the example of other political animals uh, ants and bees. Um, so he doesn't think that we're genetically related to them in a way that would be closer than to say other, other mammalian species, but he does think that uh, our mode of interaction is meaningfully um, analogous uh, to what they're doing. So the um, way in which Aristotle thinks about organizing the animal world is in the first instance between animals that he calls uh, social as opposed to sporadic, that is animals that live just one off, like bumblebees or um, carpenter bees or something, um, uh, and then animals that live in, in colonies and in, in, in groups. Um, and then he has a secondary uh, division in which um, he divides uh, the sociable ones into ones that are political and ones that are not political. And the political ones create something that is of value to the commonality. 
whereas the not political ones are meant to be like um, antelope in a herd or something that aren't doing anything together, although they live together and benefit from living together, but they don't create honey or the kind of things that humans create together. So he thinks that humans are like ants or bees that do in fact create this thing in common, um, and they can only reach, now here he gets beyond or um, outside of uh, uh, contemporary science, because he imagines that we, um, uh, through living together in these groups, achieve our, our, our final end, our telos. So he's a very systematically teleological uh, kind of thinker. He imagines that the city-state is the proper natural environment for humans, just as the hive would be for bees or the nest is for ants. And he supposes we can't achieve the capacity that we have as the kind of organisms individually that we are outside of that, that any human who could flourish outside of a state he imagined would either be less than a human or more than a human, a beast or a god. Um, uh, so that if we are to be the creatures that we are, we must do it within these organized systems for which he thinks we have a natural tendency. The trick is, however, um, we don't, unlike the honeybees or unlike the ants, we don't always look towards the good of the whole. We have the capacity to aim at our own individual good or <laughs> our own um, no, family good or all, he talks about factions. So um, he was really aware of, of basically the tension between within group Precisely. In between group processes. This is, if you look at uh, Aristotle's Politics, this uh, a great work, um, that really is the driving idea, is that yes, humans are naturally sociable. They are sociable aiming at this life together to create something together, but they also have this capacity to aim at their own advantage. And that's how you help managing that becomes the whole work of politics. I think the reason that this is so relevant to the uh, Human Energy Project and, and, and Tehard is that I, what, the way I see what took place back then was a miniature version of what the project is of the worldwide noosphere and so on is the deliberate creation of an organism-like entity at the planetary scale in our case. But what was taking place back then was exactly that in miniature mm -hmm. for the, for the city-state. And they succeeded to a degree, and so what does democracy have to do with it? So, so uh, because this is the cradle, a cradle of democratic governance. So, so why is democracy a very important part of this story? Yeah. So the um, question then, once you have these humans who are naturally, for Aristotle, living in these. Uh, 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 states is how are they going to organize themselves? Um, and he supposes there are several ways they can do it. Um, one under a master um, to have a king, um, one under a small coalition, an oligarchy. Um, and the third way is that you have self government by the residents, or at least the citizen residents of the, of the city state, and that's um, uh, democracy. The, the trick here, I think, is that, um, and here Aristotle gets into difficulties, but we don't have to worry about his difficulties. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, he actually, his lo the logic of his um, humans being, by nature, political animals, suggests that we all have this tendency to be sociable, and furthermore, to use our natural capacities of speech and reason towards these pro-social ends, and to do so at the highest level, um, the level that's closest to the divine, he would suppose. Um, so that sounds ultimately like a democracy. All of us um, aiming at something together, using speech, um, using reason, um, putting together what we know into some um, uh, a pro-social uh, end. So uh, by that reasoning, the states that are democratic should do well because they ultimately maximally use human capacity. And interestingly enough, they do seem to do well. Um, but uh, in order to do that, it's necessary to solve these 
large-scale collective action problems. Because as soon as you don't have a boss telling you what to do, you have to find some way, in fact, to uh, organize um, decision-making um, in a distributive prof process that answers to the environmental um, challenges. For example, the Persian Empire is coming and trying to take you over. The environmental challenge is surviving in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in that environment. Um, so that's, the, that's, the, that, that's really the interesting uh, story, I think, about uh, democracy in the Greek world, is that it actually did turn out to be an effective form of human organization, and in fact seems to have, over time, um, been the most successful form of organization at the city-state level anyway, in that democracies tended to replace oligarchies or tyrannies over time and to become more prevalent uh, over time. Although they were overtaken by empire at some, at some point and declined and so on. So was there a recognition that the smaller social unit, what they call the deem of about 150 uh, males, uh, citizen males was in some sense, a kind of a natural unit, and that for the democracy to become larger, then some kind of construction was was uh, was required. Was there a, an appreciation of that? Yeah. So we we look at the uh, origins of formal democracy um, in Athens, especially where we can really uh, trace this in in detail. The key breakthrough that allows democracy to work in a larger city-state, a city-state with tens of thousands of citizens, is the recognition that the smaller units, the deems, are in fact microcosms of the larger unit. So we tend to anglicize the Greek word demos to deem, meaning a village or a neighborhood that is uh, a subunit of the larger city-state. But it's exactly the same word that the Athenians or all the other Greeks used for the citizen body. So the demos of Athens is the citizens of Athens, whereas the polis of Athens, the city-state of Athens, was made up of about 139 demoi. So you have the people and the peoples, um, and you're using the same word in Greek for both these units. So it's very self-conscious what's happening here. They very clearly thought of these smaller units as being, um, in some ways, uh, microcosms of the, of the world. And then they invented federalism, so multiple scales, demos within tribes and, and so on. And so tell us more about uh, uh, that. Yeah, so the trick uh, for within a city-state is to bring the smaller units say, average of about 150 um, uh, adult male residents into the system of the larger with tens of thousands. Um, uh, and the way to do it um, turns out to be to group these smaller units um, into artificial larger units. Um, Which were just constructed out of whole cloth. They had no historical precedence, right? That's right. Uh, they are called, once again, in English, tribes. Um, uh, which makes us think, oh, they must be somehow natural or ethnic. Um, but they're entirely uh, artificial. What happens in the moment of the democratic reorganization um, is that several of these deems from different parts of the territory extended territory controlled by Athens from the inland and from the urban area and from the coastal areas were grouped into a new completely artificial tribe. And the members of those deems then were told, you are now, congratulations, <laughs> members of tribe X, uh, and you will be doing lots of things that are important together. You'll be fighting <laughs> together in the army. You'll be um, uh, engaged in various forms of religious ritual together. Sports You'll be having, is part of this, is that right? Yes, exactly. So warfare becomes part of it. And so this is a way to push back against the kind of regional specificity um, that would uh, naturally emerge the people of the coast having economic local interests with the other people of the coast and so on. The idea was to try to take this relatively large territory by Greek standards, um, uh, about a thousand square miles, and turn it into a 
single and this was unit. deliberate. This was mindful. This was just very mindful. Of, exactly right. Very thoughtful. Not just a merge or, or no. It was that's not right. Unintended. It was. That's it was right. No. So that's a so conscious th process. Yeah. So that I think is part of the fascination of thinking about this in um, your evolutionary terms. Here we have very self-conscious attempt to push towards some sort of higher level organization at this large city state. And talk about the control of elites. That was also mindful. We're going to have to do something about these powerful people in order to get them on our side, right? Yes, exactly so. So uh, uh, the democratic uh, revolution that comes about in the late 6th century BCE uh, in one sense makes of all adult males within Athenian territory equals. Now you are a citizen. That means your vote in the citizen assembly is equal to the other citizens. It means you're going to depend on each other militarily in the, in the armed forces. But the, there was never an attempt to create full equality among um, wealth classes. So how are you going to deal with the fact that those who are politically equal are not economically equal or socially equal? The problem is, once again, Aristotle saw very clearly, um, is that uh, elites will tend to seek to capture the system. Um, and uh, if the way that you deal with elites seeking to capture the system is that you just periodically um, try to take all of their wealth or rise up and attack them, you'll have permanent civil war. Um, that's bad, because then when the Persians come in, <laughs> you're knocked out very quickly. So um, or between great selection. Exactly, or exactly. Your next, uh, the next door neighbor polis will take advantage of that. So you need to have some. And there was plenty of military fighting among the. Oh polis, yes, right? yes. This is this is this is this is quite pervasive. Um, uh, and so the Athenians develop a system whereby it is expected that the wealthy will pay taxes, um, and that only the wealthy pay taxes. Uh, but on the other hand, the wealthy will be granted honors if they pay taxes at the proper level. Indeed, if you pay more than your mandated taxes, you can be given really quite grand public honors, uh, will be granted positions of leadership if they demonstrate that their leadership is aimed at the good of the whole community. So it's a, basically it's an elaborated reputation system. It is, yes, exactly so. And it's, uh, you can work it out in sort of game theoretic terms uh, as uh, a way to escape from the uh, prisoner's dilemma um, by creating a cooperative agreement in which each side gives up something. Um, so the masses agree that we will, of course, honor these people, who are wealthy, and the wealthy agree, yes, we will pay the taxes and we'll um, And you can them. literally vote someone off the island, is that right? You can vote someone and someone doesn't, and yes, doesn't play the game, decides they want to be uh, uh, the boss. Um, there's always the fear in the background that someone's going to try to become the king, the boss. Uh, and uh, uh, once a year, the Athenians would gather together um, uh, in their assembly. They assembled many times a year, but the, uh, the agenda uh, once a year was, should we um, uh, have an ostracism? That is, should we expel one of our members without a trial, just expel them? And if the vote went, yes, we should, then shortly thereafter, uh, every Athenian citizen was invited to come to the public square with uh, a piece of broken pottery um, inscribed with the name of the individual that that citizen most wanted expelled. Um, <laughs> uh, and this were, these were put into a great big pile, and then they were sorted out. Uh, and the winner, or perhaps we should say the loser, <laughs> depending on how you think about these things, the person with the plurality, um, I think it's just a pure plurality, is um, expelled for they 10 had years. To go. Had to go. And now, that and that only happened like 12 times, so it's, so it's mostly right. the threat, right? That's right. So, so if they're doing this constantly, clearly there you have another recipe for civil war. But they don't do it all the time. They limit the right to do it. They limit themselves to once a year. And uh, in the roughly 200 years in which the democratic system is for, um, sort of working at full force, um, yes, they only do it about a dozen times. 
So I just am so amazed by this. But when we think about cultural evolution, then we have basically an origination event in Athens. But then, of course, it has to spread. And there's a number of ways that it can spread. One is by conquest, let us say. Mm -hmm. Another is by copying. Mm -hmm. And so once you get um, a new cultural form like this, how did it spread? Uh, maybe it was a combination of both. Well, actually, it's economics, there's warfare, and there's copying. So, so talk about the spread. Yeah, I think it really is a, a mix of these. Uh, uh, the Athenians turn out to be after their democratic revolution, extremely effective um, at warfare. Uh, this is noticed by historians at the time. Uh, and some of the places that they conquer, other city-states within the Greek world, uh, are encouraged to become democracies. The thought is, is that they'd be more loyal to the hegemonic power, Athens, if they were. Oh, so this was, in a sense, imposed, or at least strongly encouraged some of, through conquest. In some cases, although, once again, we know that there are people within the Athenian sort of imperial domains, the empire that only lasts about 50 years, but uh, within this area, there are other states that are oligarchic. So the Athenians aren't mandating democracy for each place, but they certainly do, in some cases, encourage it. But in many cases, uh, it appears that the transition to democracy is one that is entirely voluntary, and it seems to be because the emulation or copying is just that, yeah, it works better. It's a, the, the uh, mechanisms that were devised in Athens or in other democratic city-states just turn out to solve the problem um, of how do you generate um, material welfare, how do you ensure security, um, how do you distribute the benefits of social cooperation more effectively than other forms of social organization. And we all heard the term Hellenization in school, which means that there was something, and maybe we just covered this, that was sufficiently attractive about this culture that people, it just spread on that basis, right? Yeah, it does. Uh, the very um, the, the organization into city-states rather than just in villages or towns, into self-conscious uh, city-states certainly is something that spreads from the core Greek world into uh, Anatolia, into uh, uh, southern Italy, uh, Sicily, parts of North Africa. And even to some of the empires that took over that's right. Um, so uh, it was long thought the um, idea uh, was that after the Macedonians under Philip of Macedon and his son Alexander the Great conquer the Greek city-states, so empire can work very efficiently, but then we look at culturally, the city-state form uh, becomes standard uh, really throughout uh, the, or throughout a very large uh, uh, a part of the area that was conquered by Alexander and his successors. And he, if I recall correctly, was actually spent some time as as an exile in Greece. Is that right? Uh, or, well, he was he he, he wasn't uh, an exile, um, but his father uh, gave him a, a tutor that he thought he should learn um, uh, about uh, various parts of um, uh, Greek culture. Who was his tutor? Our friend Aristotle. <laughs> I was going to ask you <laughs> that we hear about these philosophers as like disembodied, you know, philosophers, but in fact they were playing a role yeah. in the ecology of all of this, right? No, precisely right, and and self-consciously. Um, I mean, I think anyway that Aristotle wrote the politics and some of his other works about um, social organization, um, uh, intending to influence uh, how people actually did structure their city-states, and with, I think, some effect.